Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Fanalytics Podcast brought to you by the Emory Marketing Analytics Center. My name is Mike Lewis. I'm joined by Doug Battle. Doug, my day job is as a marketing professor, and one of the core concepts of marketing is this idea of segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Okay, so bear with me for a second. Okay. That the way marketing works, effective marketing works, is you understand a market, you understand the different segments out there, you come up with a product, and you position your product to satisfy or along the preferences of that segment. So, Doug, of course I am talking about the SI Swimsuit Edition, that back in the day, the SI Swimsuit Edition used to be this, I don't know, I guess they would call it like cheesecake uh, kind of these models would appear in this sports magazine. And look, be, this is before your time, Doug. Sports Illustrated was kind of the Bible of weekly sports. These high quality pictures, great coverage, great articles, kind of a I you was know, something. A subscriber, that, Mike. I got all the magazines growing up. Okay. But you missed the heyday. I'm talking like okay. in the 70s and 80s. Okay. okay. And they would sort of sneak in the swimsuit edition, right? And, and you think about the position of it, right? It was sort of a. Uh, it wasn't Playboy. They were fully clothed, and it was kind of out there for the 12-year-old heterosexual male population. And, of course, I, I just bring this up because, Doug, I, I don't know. You, you ever watch Friends on Netflix? I think that's big with Gen Z, right? A little I bit. <laughs> I don't affiliate with Gen Z, so I don't appreciate that comment. But uh, Friends, I have, I have watched Friends. I haven't watched all of Friends. I've seen episodes of Friends. And I think they always, friends always had the, this is the blah, blah, blah episode. This is the coffee episode. This is a, right. Uh, this episode of Fanalytics is the huh episode. And, and so Sports <laughs> Illustrated <laughs> Swimsuit Edition is featuring 81 year old Martha Stewart. And this is after years of really kind of going away from that core product. Now, it, like I said, I was surprised to learn that Martha Stewart was 81. But the whole point is, this seems to be the way the world is going, but I don't know what audience this is supposed to be attracting anymore because it is clearly not sort of the core audience that has historically been viewing the SI Swimsuit Edition. Well, you mentioned that SI had its heyday in the 70s and what was Martha Stewart in her 20s <laughs> back then. So maybe, I mean, maybe it is that core audience. It's that same one. <laughs> they're trying to recapture their core audience yeah i don't know i mean when i was a teenager it was like beyonce and megan fox it almost seems like now these things have become like some form of we should empower some different group of people yeah. you know now it's apparently the elderly <laughs> it feels funny <laughs> to say but hey i'll say this i'll take si over you know it was always really weird to me and even as a kid, following sports, you get yeah, Sports Illustrated. Every, yes, that is just <laughs> yeah. bizarre to me. Like the swimsuit edition, like you understand its appeal. I think anyone can. The body issue was always bizarre. I'm trying to think here. There was some massive baseball player that was on it the first time I saw. I, that just grossed me out as a sports fan and as a kid. And I still don't really understand. Like shirtless Jose Canseco or something. And no, it was. God, I'm blanking on his Why? name. I mean, someone who's 300 pounds, though. I mean, it, it was just, yeah. I don't understand whose idea that was and why. Is that still a thing? I don't think ESPN Magazine's a thing anymore. It shouldn't be. That but, probably you know, single-handedly put them out of business. But I think th there, there's sort of a core point here. and it's, it's something I think we struggle with a lot when we talk about sports and whenever sort of culture and political forces sort of invade sports. It's kind of this, and I love the example of the SI Swimsuit Edition because as a marketing professor, as a marketing guy, it's hard to actually make logical sense of this kind of stuff. Because I think you're right, that there's some sort of agenda that says, hey, this needs to be more inclusive. We need to broaden right. the audience. Yeah. But by doing so, they truly destroy the appeal of the core product. And look, you can argue that the internet destroyed the appeal of the core product a long time ago. But it's just such a curious thing to watch from a from an observer of the culture's perspective and from a marketing perspective that does this stuff make any sense? I mean, SI gets attention whenever they do this stuff, right? It's like, Hey, let's bring in Martha Stewart. Let's bring in whoever they're going to bring in next year. Right. They get some buzz. Does it go anywhere? 
It's hard to imagine that it, it does. definitely gets buzz. It's successful in that. Like we're talking about it. It's trending on Twitter, I imagine. I actually saw while we were talking last year they had a kind of a different mo- different covers and one of them was May Musk, also an elderly woman. But one of them was Kim Kardashian and one of them was CR. So it's they I don't know if they're doing I know with like college football they'll do regional covers for the start of the season. I don't know if they're just doing each demographic has its own cover. The other observation is Doug it, it's like so much of what we talk about sort of when we veer into entertainment, it's this phenomena of they didn't start a swimsuit edition that was kind of inclusive, right? They took it an existing swimsuit edition and they changed it. Yeah. Right? And I think that's why they generate the buzz. But it, like I said, it's sort of mystifying as a kind of traditionalist from a marketing perspective in 2023. Let's yeah. see, what else we got? Like I said, Doug, it's it's been a kind of a wild, an interesting week where there's numerous stories that have just kind of left me shaking my head. It's just an interesting world at this point. Yeah, Everything is um, kind of baffling and fascinating all at the same in time. In terms of picking up news stories via social media, and I don't really know what to make of this one, but it's interesting enough that I haven't done the I've sort of gone in depth in it, that there's reports that the owner of the IMG Academy, which I think is the UFC's parent company, actually, is selling IMG Academy, which I think is a high school, to a Chinese private equity firm for $1.25 billion. I see that. Wow. Billion. Billion. So we're now selling high school. So we're creating high schools that are built around athletic programs. Yes. And now we're selling these high schools to Chinese private equity firms. Doug, do you have a response or a thought? The Chinese are infiltrating our next generation in every way between TikTok, between IMG. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the campus of IMG, but it looks more like a resort. Mm. And the all I know is that there's no way they're taking actual classes because every player that comes out of there as a recruit is like a five star and regardless of the sport and they all are, it's like they're on the fast track program to become a professional athlete. You feel kind of bad for the ones that don't pan out. Well, let me tell you something, Doug, because you know that my favorite sport, the sport that I'm most interested in, well, last week was girls high school lacrosse. Yeah. is now transitioning to collegiate division two women's lacrosse but <clears throat> my daughter's high school has played img the last two years Have and, they they? and they split with them Did so they? It's, not like, it's not like they come across as sort of this loaded up group of the equivalent of five stars and blow everyone off the field this is you in know, lacrosse yeah huh they played them in florida their her junior year and they played them in in marietta georgia her senior year and yeah. they, they one in Florida and they lost in they lost at home. Yeah, I didn't realize they were that mediocre. Not to say your daughter's <laughs> lacrosse team is mediocre, but that I assume just a regular high school in Georgia could compete um, with this school that's like well scholarshiping like it's a college. I mean, my daughter's high school, a little, little shout out to Walton High School. Pretty elite. It, is a perennial final four kind of program. So they're a very good high school program. But I'm with you that you hear IMG and you think, well, they're recruiting nationwide. They've got they got D1 prospects up and down the roster and they should be they should be blowing people off the field. Right. Yeah. And I know in like in high school football, they'll lose to some of the top teams in the country. But there's other programs that are kind of behave the same way in basketball and in football. I just I uh, with something like lacrosse, you would expect no. there to only be. Which, yeah, they're not. Walton High School, look, youth sports are a fascinating thing in terms of how they've evolved over time, right? And so affluent suburban high schools tend to have programs that build from first grade up. Yeah. So Walton is definitely one of those, but Walton is not the kind of place that's bringing in ringers and recruiting and getting people to move right. district. To, to play well, I'm curious because like I saw a thing today where Nick Saban had offered this quarterback when he was 13 years old. And I remember like growing up in Birmingham, Jameis Winston was two years older than me. He was in my brother's grade. And so we played him in football and he had an offer from Ohio State when he was in the eighth grade. I'm curious for like IMG, 
where they're bringing in kids in high school, they've got to be recruiting them sixth grade, fourth grade. Like, are they going to little flag football games and scouting out the next generation of talent? Like, it does get kind of weird if, oh. if you think about it. Well, what's the, re- I mean, and again, I should probably have dug into this deeper, but it's such a fascinating headline. What's the revenue model? Because you can't imagine that <laughs> kids going to IMG are, you got to imagine there's a lot of scholarships going on, right? Maybe they're paying for the training and the facilities. And the, I mean, maybe it is like they're p- paying to live a resort at a resort and have professional training constantly and all their meals cooked for them. And the, I mean, maybe it is a service for, I don't know. I have no idea. I can't imagine it's much of a school though. Like I said, and as I was saying before, I feel bad because I do know guys like guys that played at Georgia that went to IMG that don't don't make it. And you're like, dang, they didn't even get a real high school degree. <laughs> like they're really out of luck. I played a team in high school. I played this basketball tournament and there were several teams there that were homeschool basketball teams. And we found out, oh, these homeschool basketball teams, they're actually like professional development for athletes and they take these kids they had kids from like africa like seven foot tall kids that they would bring into the u.s and t- i mean this is like a real thing that oh. happens no one talks bring them into the u.s teach them how to play basketball one out of every hundred of them will make it into the nba and i guess somebody's making money off of that the rest of them they're in these little basketball academies yeah. like i i remember feeling really bad for them and I had, i've got an example of that there was one in chicago i think it was called boys to men academy and yeah. it I think it was literally two teachers who were also coaches and about 15 kids. Right. And I think it lasted a couple of years. But again, let's come back to this number. $1.25 billion. I mean, the only thing I can think is that is there potentially money on the back end, right? That if you own these it's like kids, an investment in the kids the high school, you get like 10% uh, you know, of their career earnings. <laughs> Right. Or do you have a more of, I mean, you probably can't sign those deals, but do you have more of an ability to acquire them as future properties and assets and brands going right. forward? It doesn't seem like it should be allowed though, does it? No, there, it's, there's something fishy. I don't know if you remember, you probably do remember, do you remember the fake high school that played, I think they played IMG in football. They created this Sycamore, Bishop Sycamore. <laughs> It was a fake high school. And like, I think they had kids on the team that were like 25 and they were, they made themselves out to be this elite football program. They got ESPN to televise one of their games and they lost by like 80 points because they didn't. And then there was, and then somebody researched the school and found out it's actually not a credible or accredited or legitimate in any way, school program, any of that. It was just this made up thing. And they got people to pay to get quote unquote exposure to play on ESPN and get absolutely waxed by, I think it was IMG. I don't know if you, I, I like, I feel I, like we talked about this like two years ago, but I just wish that part of the story was that like Eli Manning had been the quarterback. No, they, but no. you know what I mean? Said that from yeah. his Penn, was his Penn state tryout. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is some strange stuff that goes on and how they're monetizing this, like how IMG is worth over a billion dollars as a high school as a I'm wondering if because I know IMG is more than just that high school like I yeah. if and so like was this just well, the that, high school that was acquired or is it the entire it IMG Academy which I assume is the high school I mean here I mean let's sort of little thought experiment so maybe in this world of NIL you are now in a position that essentially when your kids leave IMG Academy they're almost leave you're almost bringing in kids to sell them on your NIL preparation. So right. you essentially they're leaving I am they're leaving the academy with an agent and relationships already commercial relationships already set up and so perhaps that's the angle. But again, if this is where NIL is going, I mean we speculated that it, we said it was the wild west. This could be taking on proportions Beyond, I think, even what we were speculating a couple of years ago. Okay, so I found some numbers. IMG Academy's tuition is approximately $84,400 a year (laughs) for boarding students and $67,400 for day students. Very competitive with Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, I believe. (laughs) So 
my thing i just don't know how they have that many elite athletes that can afford that well I think are they giving is it all scholarshiped and then well but i, I mean there are i do know people like i had a friend in high school who 100 percent had the family and he was a good athlete and i know like they would have paid for him to yeah. have that top tier training and like positioning for college athletics so there are those kids but it seems like img is getting a, a lot of kids like it, i don't know like they're well, getting the real elite talent not just the really rich people i guess and i don't know that those two overlap that much shipping the elite men's football and basketball talent right and maybe a little bit of women's basketball yeah but the majority there's probably a lot of kids because I know what you're talking about. There's a, it's almost a status symbol to say my kid is a division one athlete. Yeah. And so with the amount of resources that some families have, you definitely imagine a scenario. It's hard to comprehend though, Doug. It's not a maybe, rational. Be maybe spending like a quarter of a million dollars in tuition or more with room and board to try and get a woman's lacrosse scholarship. Well, to be fair, yeah. <laughs> from an investment standpoint, if it's that and you get a scholarship and you get a full ride to college, could be could pay off. It could say if they have a college savings and they're like, you know what, yeah. our kid's going to be a college athlete. Let's just double down and ensure that they get in and get a scholarship to the best school. Kid gets into Duke with a full ride for four years. It's money well spent. So, I mean, you can start to see the value in it. What's the sport, though? I think I'm almost buying into your scenario, right? Because your kid plays four years at Duke. They're Lacrosse. probably going to get into any med school they or the investment banking type. It's very impressive, right? So it's resume construction. But yeah. I mean, I could see that. I think my thinking is with football and basketball, they probably give scholarships to some of the yeah. top players. And then my bet is they're making their money on tennis and golf and swimming and lacrosse and all the other sports where people are saying because img creates this brand this aura of elite athletic programs yeah. through their football and basketball because that's what puts them on the map and then let's say they they give out a hundred scholarships between the two sports but they bring in five thousand kids at other sports that are paying tuition then like but that's the question. Is it anywhere near that big, right? Yeah, I don't know how many kids are at IMG. No, look, I get it because let's say you bring in those kids and you start working in them on NIL preparation from day one. It's like a thousand, suddenly, by the way. Okay, and then suddenly your average IMG student, you can imagine a scenario where they're leaving that academy with 100,000 followers and suddenly they're a very lucrative and like you get some home runs in there with multi-million followers, they're now very lucrative NIL type properties. What you we're saying is it's a good yeah. idea to spend a quarter of a million dollars to send your kid to IMG. That's well, the takeaway from this podcast. I, I don't know if it is, but there's a lot of people playing different angles. Okay, Doug. Yeah, related no, the more I look at it, like I'm running the numbers over here. So they got a thousand kids. Okay. Let's say they give out a hundred scholarships. So you got 900 non-scholarships let's say there's 900 people paying full tuition at 80 grand a year well that was with room and board so let's just go okay, with okay let's do the uh, other one then yeah <laughs> 60 set we'll say 70 70 000 dollars times 900 people i mean that's 63 million dollars a year just yeah, that doesn't, get you to, that doesn't get you to a valuation of one point two five billion, well, especially when your facilities like are that yeah. expensive. Like if you see, I yeah. mean, it's like they own Disney World practically. It's in Florida. It's palm trees everywhere. I mean, like I said, it looks like a massive resort. Well, Doug, and you got to pay your coaches at that kind of situation, probably more. And look, there might be a few teachers, right? They might have a teacher or two. Okay, Doug. I seriously, I would love to see their curriculum. Like I would, I really would love to see what that's like. Cause I mean, there's just no way there's now we're you take, you to, take a thousand kids and all they care about is sports and all their parents care about is sports and you make a high school. Yeah. You gotta get the, but you know, you gotta look, you gotta get that, te those test scores too. Right. Because you gotta get the, you gotta be able to get some of these kids into the Ivies. All I'm saying hey, is you, chat GBT is going to be working overtime. <laughs> <laughs> There's at schools like this, yeah, writing lots of essays. Okay, now Doug, related to this NIL speculation, the Cavender twins 
<clears throat> have finished at Miami and they took some shots at the NCAA on the way out. I believe it was a tweet or a TikTok. I think it was a TikTok. I think they're bigger on TikTok. A TikTok video essentially pretending to call the NCAA and ask if they could have permission to graduate. So the NIL, sorry, the NCAA kind of raises, throws up its hands, gives up on NIL. They go after essentially. Well, I think the first thing the NCAA went after was the Cavender Twins, who transferred from what was it, Cal State Fullerton, but to Miami basketball, and busted I think them. One of them for, averaged like six points a game or something. I think the other one was solid, though, right? Yeah, but it's just it's a yeah. lot of money per point. I will. I would yeah. say. But busted them for having meetings with Miami boosters before they had agreed to come over. So NIL continues to be an absolute mess. And even after these young women made millions of dollars, I believe they were in the millions of dollars categories. Yes. yes. Still not particularly happy with the NCAA. Yeah, that's a weird one. You'd think if a system benefited you that much, you would actually be like, it's got its flaws, but... <laughs> Could be worse. <laughs> Could be worse. Well, Doug, here's the next. Here's the question: What happens to athletes like the Cavender Twins post sports? They're still a marketable asset. How quickly will they leave their lose their appeal? Or I mean, or will they be well, able to transition and? Come I think the they're celebrities well, now. I think it's like a Kardashian type thing where it's like people know them now, and they're going to always profit off of that. They, I'm seeing on. Just typing in their name, my news feed, it's like, oh, they did an Instagram or they did a TikTok with their mom for Mother's Day. And she's like fit and attractive. Like maybe she'll be in Sports Illustrated Swimsuit next year. <laughs> oh, the Cavenders. Yeah. You know what? Sports yeah. Illustrated Swimsuit is probably not big enough for the Cavenders at this point. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think, didn't they have like a WWE deal? I mean, oh, they're gonna, right. they're gonna they're monetize. Right. They're smart. They're like the Paul <laughs> brothers. I think they're like the Paul brothers. It's like they're female parallel, and they're gonna find ways to always monetize well, the fact that they're famous. So I'm gonna root for them. People do it. I know a guy from high school that was big on Vine, and he's still making a living off of like YouTube and Instagram, like just not making anything substantial as far as like producing anything of value for anyone it's just like he's famous and he gets paid to be famous so i think that's what people like the cavender twins will do and like i said they seem savvy they clearly they weren't necessarily concerned about playing by the rules in college as much as getting a big payday and who can blame them and they're gonna they're gonna be famous (laughs) they're gonna be i don't know maybe they'll go into modeling or acting or wrestling or (laughs) There's yeah. so many things. Clothing line, own your own fashion brand. Hey. Or just post post videos yeah. promoting local businesses. And is that enough, or right? National just, businesses. Just yeah. keep posting videos, just sort of generating con running your own sort of communications company from fifteen seconds at a time or thirty seconds at a time via TikTok. Yeah, I was actually t- I was talking to my brother about this kind of phenomenon in our generation, and he's like what are these people, not the Cavender Twins necessarily, but people our age, people in their 20s and 30s who are making a living from posting videos and pictures and stuff primarily because they're attractive <laughs> oftentimes, mm-hmm. like if we're real about it and people want to watch that or see it and are naturally inclined to watch. He's like, what are they, how are they going to, what are they going to do when they're like 60? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know, maybe like we didn't, like our parents' generation, they weren't content creators in their 20s. Like maybe they would still be doing that if they were like Martha Stewart. She's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Like maybe that'll be what the world's like at that point. Maybe we'll have 60 year olds making content for a living and flexing on social media about their new outfit. I don't know. That's an interesting thought exercise, right? Because I mean, you it's know, like you- a whole market. It's like a whole like industry that didn't exist a generation ago and and there is that question how does it age but there's always been fame and fandom right and so uh, let me but were there people making a living off of just like not being a model or actor like not being in the market in that way but just off of the fact that people knew who they were for nothing not like what we have now and I, (laughs) I, i think the big difference is 
that it always used to be you always had to have the support of some platform, right? Like, so Polly Shore, I don't know if you know who Polly Shore no, is. He was one of these MTV celebrities. It was big for spring break and then ended up in some movies where, and he comes to mind because he was sort of just a, no, he was like a novelty act. Yeah. But how many of those get to continue on? And look, I'll ask you this question. Like, if you think about musical artists or actors, how many of them get to have the whole 40 or 50 year career? Right. I, I will say this. All right. One of my favorite bands growing up, I recently met one of the band mates, one of the band members. Yeah. And they were big. You know, he was a teenager. He was late teens, early 20s. And it's like he works like a regular job now yeah. as like a 40 year old guy. And it's it was weird for me to be like, really? Like, because you were this big star. Like, that was kind of bizarre to me. But there are certain professions where it's like, well, you can do it for 10 years. But I mean, there's very few people that are going to monetize that for no. forever. Well, and, I mean, going back to this issue of like the, like Taylor Swift can probably have a career like Cher or Barbara Streisand. Yes. Yeah. Go all the way until she's 70. Yeah. But most of the sort of the young pop stars, you, you we will have quickly forgot. Like it's one of the differences between entertainment and sports, right? The... Georgia Bulldog football team, you'll root for them till you're 80, right? Right. Where these acts tend but, to like. Well, I will say, I don't know, to counter that a little bit, my podcast for Georgia football, a lot of the guys I would talk to were guys, again, that I worshipped when I was in high school or as a kid. And you talk to them and it's like, oh, they work for my friend's dad's company. Like they work in real estate or they work. And I'm not belittling that in any way. I'm just saying that a lot of types of stardom are very valuable. Being a Georgia football player, sure. a star Georgia football player is very valuable. But maybe of the guys, even of the stars, I mean, I would say of the stars over the years at a program like Georgia, a small percentage end up making a living in the NFL for more than a couple of years, more than a year or two. And yeah. then it's like, okay, so then what? And now it's like, well, there's the, like, the whole thing with Stetson Bennett this year was that he could probably live off of being George's quarterback the rest of his life. Like he probably doesn't even have to go to the NFL because he can just do local stuff and the media and all that. Like you can monetize it that way. But for a lot of guys, it's like 10 years ago, you were probably worth millions of dollars to the school. And now like, it doesn't matter. Like you, you got to get a job. Like you got to go back to school. You got to figure something out because they're, you're not getting paid retroactively for that. And I, I think that's kind of, what I imagine it being like as far as this kind of well, it's probably content the, culture. I think it's probably true for anything, right? I mean, you look yeah. at the number of stars, you look at the folks that are, let's say, the top 10 movie stars in any given year, right? And the odds are that they're, they're all going to quickly fade, except for like, look, Tom Cruise is probably the one guy from the 80s to now that can have number one movies, right? And so it's, yeah. it's a filtering. It's a filtering process that I don't think we know how it's going to go for the social media creators, because I think the big question is, well, what will people do? I mean, because it's hard to imagine, Doug. And I almost think it is almost a little unfortunate to call you Generation Z. Because I, <laughs> I think agree with between an 18-year-old and a 25-year-old at this point. Yeah. It's sort of interesting to imagine, like, is an 18, like, my daughter is 18. Right, it's right. All She's talking. Gen Z. Yeah. Is she still going to be, is that going to be her primary source of media? When she's 35, 45, 55, 65, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to say yes to that, but it could very well be. We don't know what it's going to evolve to. Yeah, I think it'll. That's why I mentioned Vine earlier. I mean, when I was in high school, Vine was as big as TikTok is now, and it doesn't exist. Vine had a hilarious moment. Vine was hilarious for a minute, right? Those loops that people would do. Yeah, Vine was kind of great. It was TikTok yeah. before TikTok, and it, I'm, to the best of my knowledge, wasn't owned by the Chinese, and there, <laughs> there wasn't <laughs> as much data issues. Um, as And that's with the TikTok stars. I think they probably should position themselves for other platforms, and I think they're smart. I think everybody knows that. But like my friend who, and I say friend, my acquaintance who I knew who was really big on Vine, when Vine died, I was like, oh, that sucks for him. There goes his whole following. Like, it, that's worth a lot of money. And he just blew up on YouTube. Like, he, people know who he is. They'll find him. There's always going to be a platform. And some people that are savvy about it are, are going to just switch platforms and be nimble 
and adjust and adapt and continue. It's like, oh, like U2, like people don't buy CDs anymore. So is U2 done? Like, no, they just, now their music streams like, or Coldplay or something like that. Like <laughs> you gotta be nimble. You can't be, you can't just sell your vinyl records. And in, in this case, I don't think TikTok's gonna last very long. <laughs> it's my personal take, <laughs> but I think people like the Cavender twins will outlast TikTok on other, Some, on, on YouTube or on other. And that's the bet, the bet, right? Some of them will. Yeah. Some of them will take it in t- entirely. De- like the Paul brothers seem like they're going to figure something out, but you know, a lot of these folks will disappear. Like, like, and again, I'll say this with the wisdom of age, what's kind of cute at 25 is very often repellent at 35 and 45 with some of these celebrities, right? And so that's that's what I'm saying with my brother being like, what happens when these people are 60 and they're trying the same thing? (laughs) Oh, Oh, man. The other thing that's going on right now, and look, we have this conversation. We've had this conversation for multiple years. The NBA playoffs come in. Yeah. And I always view this as, well, this is where the narratives are written, where the brands are built. For years, we've been saying, who's up next? Is it Luka yeah. Doncic? Is it Trey Young? Doug, maybe we got all that wrong, <laughs> right? It's almost like, who's up next? Well, it's LeBron James and this guy that's just a joy to watch out there in Denver. And maybe Jason Tatum. I mean, it's kind of yeah. fascinating to watch where uh, it's not where I thought the league would have. If you had asked me a couple of years ago who the who would be in the limelight for the NBA player, at playoffs it would not have been that set of people yeah i definitely when lebron went to the lakers i was just talking to a buddy about this i was like i thought lebron was going to kind of fizzle out and or phase out but while he phased out like anthony davis would phase in and by this point in time anthony davis would be the face of the Lakers, face of the NBA, and LeBron would be kind of what D Wade was to LeBron in Miami. That's what I envisioned, and so I do think it, it is beneficial to his legacy that he's the guy at this point in his career at this age and after and all these years. Because yeah. you called it last week. You said you thought it's like this is almost. It feels like it's from the screenwriters, Lakers, Celtics, that LeBron defeats Durant. Then he, or well, something. he doesn't. Fe- he doesn't right. defeat Durant now. He's I missed Durant. that one. Yeah. Then he defeats Durant, and then he beats the Celtics. We didn't get that, but in a way, this almost feels to me. This almost feels better. Where Jokic is has caught fire in terms of the marketing this time. It's like the NBA finally discovered how to work with him, well, and so and in I- some ways, it almost feels. But and here's the twist in it, possibly. Or is this like in WE wrestling parlance? Does LeBron put does a defeat of LeBron by Jokic make him the new face of the league? I do so think the last dance or the new face of the league. Yeah, it's a win win. It's a yeah. win win. Even if it ends up being Celtics Lakers is a win win. Because if Tatum beats yeah, you know, I go back to Tatum's rookie year. I remember him dunking on LeBron, I believe it was game six against the Cavs in the Eastern Conference Finals, and kind of saying hello, like I'm Jason Tatum. I'm gonna be here for a while. I'm the new, I'm the new guy you gotta worry about. And so now all these years later, if he were to finally because they lost that series, it was tight, but they lost that series. If he were to take that next step and become the alpha, become the guy that wins the championship. I mean, 51 points in game seven of the the last round of the Eastern Conference playoffs. Pretty impressive from Tatum. And he's in a position, much like Devin Booker has been in the past, where it's like, this could be yeah. his chance to become... We've always talked about him. Like, do, do people want to be like Mike? Do people want to be like Jason Tatum? Like, he's not really that guy. But if he were to beat LeBron in a finals, he's yeah. that guy. And he's wearing the right jersey to do it right oh yeah that's kind of a key part to this story oh yeah and so Jokic is not but I think Jokic like I remember when LeBron was with the Heat and granted LeBron's Heat they were so dislikable because of how they came to be and LeBron leaving Cleveland and the manner in which he did it so there were a lot of people that just were going to pull for whoever they were playing and it just so happened to be Dirk Nowinski and the Mavericks who most people by the way had written off I mean the second best player on that team was Jason Terry and it was they were an afterthought. And winning that series, 
made them legends and created a lot of Dallas Mavericks fans, a lot of Dirk Nowitzki fans. I think that's the position that Denver is in right now with Jokic and they, that the NBA is in with Jokic, where it's like if he does win this series, he's going to he's gonna earn the permanent fandom of the LeBron haters, which might be the second biggest fandom in the NBA behind the LeBron fans. Or might be the biggest, right? Or Yeah, yeah, it could be the biggest. And so... I'm excited well, about it. I mean, it's going to be fun to watch. I still think it's Lakers Celtics, but you know, I'm pulling for I'm pulling for Denver versus Miami Finals. I want to see Jimmy Butler has actually put together an astonishing career. Yes, I mean the level of success and the level of clutch performances. I don't actually know how to think about him because he never seems to he never seems to be anywhere near becoming the face of the league. No, but he's. Like I said, that's really an astonishing career that he's put together in terms of always sort of overperforming where you think his team is where his team should be. Yeah, and Jimmy Butler, another thing is he's at times been thought to be a cancer. Like oh, he's not a good locker room guy. You don't want him on your team. And then he all of a sudden he's the guy you want closing the game and he's the guy you want in the lot he's the guy you want taking an eight seed potentially for the nba finals so he was the 30th pick in the 2011 draft so okay. first off 2011 yeah he's been in the league for a while i mean he's not some up-and-comer like i feel like he's one of those perennial up-and-comers kind of like jason tatum is now even though tatum is much younger of course but where it always feels like he's on the brink he might become one of the elites but he's kind of like a perennial third team NBA guy and like coming off the bench for team USA in Chicago. There was a time where it, I mean, he was kind of in that Paul George category where it was like, he's a great two way player. He's better than a three and D guy. Could he become the guy that shuts down LeBron? And the answer was no. <laughs> and then he's bounced around and like in Minnesota, I know there was a lot of controversy and, almost his reputation changed to it's like well he had the potential to be that guy but he doesn't have the intangibles and now all of a sudden it's like okay he's got the intangibles he's just i don't know if he's kind of an old school player in the sense he's got a lot of mid-range to his game he's not a he's not the modern player he's not popping deep threes only he's not an analytics guy in the sense of he's only taking the most efficient shots but I, I put he's him a in warrior the category though right yeah. 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 So he's I would love to see I would love to see him win a finals. I don't think it's gonna happen. I would love to see it. Eric Spolstra, a guy who I thought was kind of a goof when he coached the Heat with LeBron and Dwayne Wade. This isn't his first time taking a kind of undermanned team deep into the Eastern Conference playoffs. And he's gained I mean, he's gained a lot of people's respect post LeBron, which is kind of rare. In the NBA, you look at guys have been getting fired lately. Boonholzer yeah. last week. Yeah. Coach. Yes. Yeah, Monty William. I mean, guys who are coach of the year one year and fired the next or win a championship and are fired two years later. Yeah. It, it is. Ulstra was definitely one. I would have said two years post LeBron and Dwayne Wade, he's done. And he's done the quite the opposite. I think he's had a more impressive post LeBron career than his career with LeBron, even though he did win a few championships there. It's hard to see how the analytics merit these coach firings as a as an aside. Yeah, it's no, I don't coming down very, 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 very quickly. Well, they're talking like the Bucks are talking about interviewing Mike Brown right now. You look at you go from a former coach of the year, former NBA Finals guy in Boonholzer to a perennial like Jeff Fisher type, like a perennial like oh he's pretty good but never gets over the hump. I don't get it. I don't get it. I there's very few the one firing that paid off that didn't make a lot of sense at the time was when the Warriors hired Steve Kerr. They were coming off a year where they made a playoff run and they fired Mark Jackson. And Steve Kerr ended up being the right guy for that job, for that dynasty. And so, I mean, who knows if they would have been a dynasty with Mark Jackson. It probably all comes back to the last dance and the Bulls firing Doug Collins. Yeah. Because they didn't think he they could get to that next level and I found the magic of Phil Jackson. Yeah. Some other NBA questions for you, Doug. I think we're agreed. It's like again, the NBA playoffs, this is where the brands are built. 
any way this comes down from here is some great narrative, some great storytelling. Just, a couple it, other things, though. Yeah, yeah. Has the, can we put a fork, can we pronounce a resolution on the Sixers, the process? Oh, man. They, I will say, the year that Toronto won it all, that was when the process had its chance to pay off because they lost that game seven on a buzzer beater to Kawhi Leonard and then watched the Raptors win the finals. But Ben Simmons, Markel Fultz, I don't, I don't know that the process was a bad idea. Like if you look at when they drafted Markel Fultz, had they drafted Jason Tatum instead, like tanking positioned them to have Jason Tatum and Joel Embiid on the same team, that's a winning formula. So I don't know that the process theory didn't well, pay off, but drafting Ben Simmons, drafting Markel Fultz, I just think they drafted poorly, Mike. But then, but I, the thing, right? The this the the uncertainty is part of that process, right? Sure, sure. You're taking guys that have played one year of college basketball. I, I don't know. It's it, I thought it was the Sixers always have always struck me as almost like this kind of strange throwback team, maybe because they they went with the dominant center and the type of guys they picked. Did not seem really. Nerlens Noel was in there. He busted. What was it? Uh, Jabari Parker was that one of them? To or, no, she went to the box. Okafor. Okafor. I don't know. I lose track yeah. with. Yeah, I, I, I get some of these Chicago high school players. Yeah, sure. Confused. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it's an interesting idea, right? And again, when I always think kind of long term, how do you maintain that fan base? This idea of tanking has obviously been huge and basketball has been huge in baseball these teams losing 100 games a year it's really difficult to execute on that other side it's uh, it's a fun thing to watch play out and the fact that they're now going down with Embiid and Harden feels like the process kind of took a detour and it still didn't arrive where they wanted it yeah and speaking of tanking Mike NBA draft lottery is Tuesday (laughs) and there's the most hyped NBA draft well, lottery in a generation. I was going to say, like, typically that's not huge news, but this year is a year where if there weren't a lottery, I think half the league would have tanked to try to get that last pick. Who's the number two pick this year, Doug? I have no idea. It's not Victor Wimbayama, I'll tell you that, who apparently isn't particip- He's not doing a combine. Or, it's like he knows. He knows. Everyone knows and has known for some time. I'm looking at the teams with the best odds. Detroit, boring. Houston, boring. San Antonio, Popovich, Wimbayama, his last number one pick, I believe, was a man named Tim Duncan. Could be fun. Charlotte, man. Portland, I would love. I mean, I love Portland. I love Damian Lillard. Nothing would make me happier than Portland getting that number one pick. Orlando, though. I mean, a lot of these potential landing spots, like Detroit, Houston, Charlotte, Orlando, Indiana Pacers, Washington Wizards. There's quite a few teams that aren't exciting landing spots. Like he's not going to be paired with a star, but you look at Portland's got like the fifth best odds. I think the Dallas Mavericks have like the tenth best odds. Now there's one that would <laughs> that really, would. I mean, it would change the next ten years of the league with Doncic and Wimbayama. Well, it would definitely change the offseason. Would the narrative in the offseason would change? completely overnight i don't know doug is you're saying some of those names the one that and again maybe i think about some of this stuff a little bit different houston had a very nice run in terms of building up a fan base and even an international fan base yeah i i could see the nba almost wanting him to land at houston to rebuild their brand a lot of i mean look throwing out dallas (sighs) wow that would be the most exciting place for him to the most interesting place for him to land I want um, it so bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, if that, I will be so excited if the Dallas Mavericks land Victor Wimbayama. So we will see. I know, I also know people who don't think he's going to pan out, by the way, say he's because of injury, because he's so frail, because he's so lean. And guys that have that body shape, there always seems to be an injury problem. I right. Mean, it, it's just a, 
that and it's almost like this like and this is not coming at it from an orthopedics perspective this is like this kind of this human eyesight kind of thing of guys that are sort of a little too long it seems like things break down i know last year in the draft chet holmgrum got a lot of buzz a lot of hype and he's another seven foot guy that can pop the three he's got a lot of guard skills and people are talking about him maybe not with the same amount of hype as Wimbayama, but he was kind of like a Wimbayama light and there was speculation or not speculation per se but there were some people are saying why isn't this guy being considered for number one overall they're going to regret this and the knock on him was injury even though he didn't have an injury history well plays i believe one game against lebron james in the off season in kind of an exhibition and he's out for the season for his first year and so we still haven't seen him play and not to say he's going to bust but he was another one where you just looked at him and you're like that guy is going to get hurt a lot kevin durant a lot of people thought that about him and he's had a healthy career for the most part i mean of course he tore his achilles <laughs> at one point but what i mean by that is that he's been able to have a career joel Embiid kind of got the at one point i thought joel Embiid was gonna be like greg odin he mm-hmm. not he, different body type by the way not this yeah. lanky win by body type but showed a tendency to get hurt a lot pretty early and then has been healthy for the last few years and so it's hard to predict injury it's hard to that's probably the one thing in sports or i don't know if there will ever be a number but and maybe that gut feel of looking at the guy's frame and saying eh I don't know. It looks like he'd probably get hurt the first time he tries to take a charge with LeBron or Giannis coming at him. Well, Maybe that's the best he can do. Wemby is the next big thing in terms of the NBA branding. The hype yes. is going to be – it's going to be at the same level as Zion, right? I think and it's it, bigger. Well, it, it, I think you're probably right, but it's the in terms of guys entering the league with those mega brands behind him, It'll be interesting to see how this one plays out, how this brand is built. Because I suspect that while you and I know who he is, I suspect that the general public is about to learn who he is yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Now, and one of the other, well, go on. Uh, well, go I was going to say with Zion, he was one that he's built like a tank. Mm-hmm. And going back to that injury conversation, you would have thought he's about as sure of a bed as you're going to get just from looking at a guy that like, the wear and tear of the NBA, he could probably handle. Like, he could probably play fullback in the NFL and have a 10 year career. He's built like that. He's built and like he's going to tight end, Doug. Yeah. And he's been hurt the entire time he's been in the NBA. So, they're, like I said, they're, it's hard to look at a guy and be able to really determine. You would think that a Kevin Durant would have had the career that Zion's had and vice versa in terms of injury. Okay, but where I was going, so yeah, Wemp sorry. is the next big brand. One of the other guys that we've speculated about is years, for years, is this guy going to step up? Is he going to become one of the new faces of the NBA? Is Ja Morant. <laughs> and obviously that one, yeah, making headlines. And again, the, when things like this go down, I can't help but look at this as the marketing professor. I mean, just as we started the episode, here it's interesting, right, where everything that's happening seems to be like a marketing intervention of folks coming down and saying, hey, we need to protect the NBA brand and you also need to protect your brand. Mm-hmm. The speculation I've heard today is that, I mean, he's suspended right now from everything to deal with the Grizzlies for showing a gun on, an I think, an IG video that they're talking about, or at least the initial trial balloons sort of meet, put out into the media were maybe a year-long suspension. So going from one of the top young stars and top young brands and kind of really the key to that Memphis Grizzlies brand to really kind of being on, I don't know, on an intensive care as a brand really in danger Mm. of this story going sideways from a, a guy that was in a position to make a I mean, you think about what these guys are worth, Doug. I mean, a guy that was in a position to make half a billion dollars over the course of his career to now something where there seems to be quite a bit more uncertainty and the strangeness and all the background, right? Because I I talked to some media out of Memphis. They were saying in a strange way, this seems to also be getting him more credibility with some different audiences out there. And so it's a very, it's a very strange story that the NBA, I think it's actually more perilous for the NBA than the NBA realizes. I think there's going to be more John Morant references and rap songs. 
<laughs> so I think that's what you're touching on with like he might be great, gaining some credibility. He also he had a shoe deal with Nike a couple years back, and I know this year they released his signature shoe or last year in the last calendar year. So I don't know if that's in jeopardy with Nike. And I think the fear for the NBA is like a Henry Ruggs situation where something actually happens. Because with Morant, it's funny that he now has this perception that, and I, again, I say it's this perception. I'm not saying this is what I think. The perception is like, oh, he's got some, he's got some tendencies. Like he's got this desire to be in the streets and to be affiliated with some dangerous stuff. And some stuff the NBA doesn't want affiliated with its brand after years of trying to mm-hmm. become a family friendly product, you know, of becoming. Yeah, I think the Ron Artest Malice at the Palace really hurt their brand, the league's brand. And I remember as a kid being told things about the NBA and its players and players like Steph Curry, players like LeBron James have helped recreate the NBA's image. And so they don't want to be right. associated with any kind of violence. Yeah, uh, I remember. The some of the early stuff from the I mean it's a certain kind of a touch point the last dance yeah where Jordan is talking about the culture of the Chicago Bulls team when he came in yeah right? it, it oh, he's talking about cocaine a, and strippers and yeah a yeah, continue yeah, I think that was the, the stars away from some of that stuff yeah I think that was the NBA's reputation and, and there's been little instances I remember Lou Williams leaving the bubble to go to a strip club uh, Magic City to get some, some chicken wings. Delight. Some of that's delightful, though. I mean, (laughs) yeah. So I look at it and I see the NBA's concern, but I also look at it and say, what has Ja Morant done? Has he committed a crime? Like, I don't know. Like, is he registered with the guns that he's been seen with? But it's not a crime to carry a gun. gun. It's not a crime to show a gun in an Instagram video. Yeah. So that. Terms of service. Yeah. So to me, it it is kind of interesting where the reaction has been as if, like, he committed a crime like that's really how he's kind of been put not even on trial like it's just everyone's jumped the gun and no pun intended kind of assumed that he's up to no good where it's like what because he took a picture with a gun i know a lot of people have taken pictures with guns well here's a question if they suspend him for a year is sort of the you have to behave yourself clauses strong enough yeah that you can take away I don't know what he makes, $40 million a year. Yeah. That that seems like an iffy proposition as well for, again, no crime, just. Just a, a bad look. A bad a, look. And it's a bad look that has nothing. I don't think he's wearing, I don't think he's wearing grizzly clothing in the video. I don't think he's wearing an NBA logo in the, in the look, right? So in his private life, on his private channels, a bad look and you can take away that amount of money from him. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, I'm just really curious. I mean, I think that, like I said, it's possible that he's carrying guns he's not licensed to own or that he's that he is legitimately affiliated with <laughs> groups that that are dangerous and that are not good. But again, making those assessments based on a picture or video where he's just holding a gun, to me, is it is a little bit interesting it is interesting that uh, yeah he suspended double digit games at least and people were talking saying all kinds of things about him and i again i'm not saying he has great character i have no idea i'm just right. saying that it, it almost feels kind of blown out of proportion and again like i said that i think this concern on the nba side is a henry rugg situation where something bad ends up happening because there's not discipline and then it's not just a bad look and they want to keep it from being more than just a bad look. So I, I fully understand where the NBA is coming from. I understand where the Grizzlies are coming from, but the public's perception of John Morant as this like hoodlum now, because he has a picture with a gun is maybe and, <laughs> premature or. <laughs> and of course, right. The context is this is a follow-up of he and a friend beating up a high school kid and some other social media. Uh, Doug, like, I mean, in some ways, I, th- I think for the general public, it's also fascinating. It's like, there's so many dollars in play. You know, we're literally talking about a half billion dollars or more. Turn off your social media, right? I mean, for a lot of us, that would be a very easy decision, right? It's Yeah. I will say, I if Morant were in the draft, his stock would be falling right now. Yeah. Okay, Doug, to, to wrap it up for this week, 
we have a return of our, and again, we should do more of this, but a return of our fan of the week st- segments. Who is your fan of the week? <laughs> Yeah, it's been too long, and there have been some good ones this NBA playoffs. A lot of sad fans that we've seen, but my favorite is the overconfident fans. And this year, it was the Golden State Warriors fan in Crypto.com Arena slash the Staples Center, counting on his fingers in Clay Thompson style, the number of championships that the Warriors have won with this dynasty, counting to four. And the context of that is he's in a building with 17 banners. For the Los Angeles Lakers bragging about four championships and a series that his team is going to lose and in a game which his team lost I think it's phenomenal I think the amount of like gall to stand there and say I don't care about your tradition I don't care about your team and the Lakers because we got four championships we got four count them one two three four now and you some I- of that Lakers and you come back <laughs> And the fan logic that comes into play on some of that is because it's going to be kind of beautiful, right? But because, look, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about this Magic Johnson stuff back in the 80s. Yeah. I'm talking about in the current era, yeah. we got four championships <laughs> and they got one in a bubble, right? Yeah. Yeah. They got I mean, the Disney, they got the Mickey Mouse trophy. <laughs> and they don't even have a real one. So you can imagine <laughs> the tortured explanation that this guy would have. And the beauty of it was he would completely believe every word he was saying. Uh, yeah. 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 And he's in a room. He's in the away crowd doing that. Like, I just love it. I love seeing fans completely delusional, completely convinced that their team is better than the other team against logic. Like again, like historically yes, not true presently, not true. But in that guy's head, those four championships are way more valuable than the Lakers' entire franchise. And in his defense, I think both of us saw that video and said, love that guy. You yeah, know? love that guy. That's how I want to be as a fan. That guy's passionate. He's doesn't even care where he's at. He's ready to take on the entire room. He's like everything. In a weird way, he's everything that's kind of pure about sports. Delusional. Yeah. He's intense. It seems like he's having a good time, even if he's going to lose. Like he's a hundred percent all in. It's a beautiful. Yeah, it was just pure (laughs) fandom. Like when we do our class, that will be part of it, Mike. (laughs) Like counting to four. And I like as a football fan, I think back to the years before the last two years when Georgia had gone twenty years without winning a championship, and Georgia's opponents, their rivals, would always say nineteen eighty because that was the last year Georgia won a championship. They would always throw that in your face. And it'd be like Auburn and Georgia would beat Auburn for like the ninth time out of the last 10 meetings. But Auburn fans were always, they always had that 1980 to make you shut up. Like it was like, we've won a championship since you, so you don't matter. And I think that's kind of what he was getting at. Like, yeah, you might be beating us, but does that really matter? Because we've won four championships more recently than you have. (laughs) I guess, I guess that's the argument there, but Again, I've experienced both sides of that. I've experienced the 1980, and I've experienced recently where like Alabama fans are like, "You guys only won two championships, and you think you're something." And it's like people will just like say the score, like 33 to 18. Like last time we played y'all, we were on top, and that's all that matters. All that matters in sports is the last game, unless, unless your team is the one that won all the old games, and then those are the games that matter. <laughs> Well, and this might be a perfect segue to something that I think we're going to launch either in the week or either next week or the following week, and that is our annual NFL fan base rankings. And I just mentioned that because when we talk about our fans of the week and whether it's Tennessee fans doing dancing in the end zone or, or it's this guy showing up, essentially putting four fingers down to remind the Lakers that, that the true basketball elite is in the San Francisco Bay Area now. Right. The passion of fans is what makes this kind of a magical thing. And, and look, one of the things is like that I always come back to, it's like fans don't even want to argue about whose team is better. Very often they'll want to argue about who the better fans are. And so we'll yeah. be getting to that pretty shortly here as soon as we figure out our – the analysis is done. I know who's at the top. I know who's at the bottom. So it's just a matter of just sort of figuring out the media calendar for getting that out there. So as always, guys, thanks for listening. You can find more content at www.fandomanalytics.com. Please subscribe, like, and share, and all that stuff. Thanks.